Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, Eric Potastic, Chair of the Political Science Department, and I'm delighted to introduce uh, today's speaker, the last in our incredible series of distinguished um, lectures the, this past year on themes about democracy, Jake Grumbach. So Jake is currently an associate professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. He was previously associate professor of political science at the University of Washington and a postdoc at the Center for the Study of Democratic Politics at Princeton. He received his doctorate in political science from Berkeley in 2018. He studies the political economy of the United States with interest in democratic institutions, labor, federalism, racial and economic inequality, and statistical methods. His work has appeared in uh, many leading uh, peer review journals, really a tremendous publication record uh, given um, how recently he received his doctorate, including the APSR, HAPS, JOP, Perspectives on Politics, and Legislative Studies Quarterly. Jacob's uh, book, Laboratories Against Democracy, How National Parties Transform State Politics, was published by Princeton University Press in 2022 and has justly received both scholarly acclaim and a great deal of media attention. The book argues that the nationalization of the Democratic and Republican parties and the increased national coordination among candidates, interest groups, and activists within each party's coalition has had the ironic consequence of producing a resurgence of state governments at the very center of American policymaking. Among many other provocative findings, the book shows that red and blue states are increasingly implementing distinct agenda agendas in areas like healthcare, reproductive rights, climate change, and voting rights. And in so doing, the book challenges the hopeful Brandeisian idea of states as laboratories for policy experimentation, where states innovate and learn from one another in an unbiased, nonpartisan way. The book won the Tate Ostrom Outstanding Book Award from APSA, as well as the Virginia Gray Award for the best political science book on the subject of U uh, US state politics or policy, and was selected by the New Yorker magazine as one of the best books of 2022. And, uh, in addition, I signed it this past semester. Uh, so uh, today, Jake will, be, uh, Jake will be speaking on his paper, Old Money, Campaign Finance, and Gerontocracy in the United States. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you here to Brown. Oh, and I should say, this is being recorded. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Eric. Um, thanks for that generous introduction and running this incredible speaker series. Thanks, Deirdre, so much for uh, so much organizing behind the scenes, uh, the tech help. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, it's similarly, uh, you know, back at my home institution last week of classes, too. So it's just uh, it's so incredible that you're out here and uh, really looking forward to presenting this. And I would say that's a, Eric did a mass, I need to hire Eric to sort of give book just sort of book jacket summaries that was incredibly on point and also i thank eric for i you know sort of shopped a few projects ongoing projects and pieces of work about which i should present thinking about a you know speaker series on democracy uh, eric picked this one which i was like hoping he would this is the new thing i'm most excited about and i think is like it's just absolutely crucial for thinking about uh, american democracy right now let me make sure it's on the screen actually um how do we get that back? Uh, I may have, uh, let me try restarting the slideshow real quick. Nice, excellent. Um, so this is the one I'm most psyched about. And often, you know, when you come out for a talk at a place like this, you want to, you know, they want to hear the hits at the conference. They want to hear the greatest hits, the book talk type of thing. But this is great. Like, do your, play your new album. This is what every musical artist wants, I think. So thank you so much. Uh, this is a joint uh, project with Adam Bonica from a lesser university, slightly to myself. Um, this project, uh, you know, really starts with the puzzle. So here, I uh, plot countries around the world and their average age of their uh, legislative chamber, so the average age of a, a politician in their legislature, like the parliament, or in the US case, the US House, the lower chamber of the legislature. And the US, to find it, you have to go all the way to the right. Ha ha, just kidding, this is only below the median. You have to go even farther, farther and farther and farther to the second to the last column, followed uh, with Cambodia slightly in the lead, but the US as the only OECD sort of wealthy country and the only democracy to have politicians at the federal level uh, uh, 
be so disproportionately old. And uh, that is part of the puzzle that motivated this project. And overall in this project, we ask why gerontocracy, which I'll define a little bit more, but uh, disproportionate rule by older citizens in a political system, gerontocracy. The US has the oldest politicians of any democracy by far. And we see in policy outcomes the US budget uh, in terms of spending as share of GDP uh, is more skewed towards older individuals as beneficiaries than uh, welfare states in other countries, mostly prioritizing uh, welfare state benefits in the form of home ownership and retirement benefits in the US compared to other countries that uh, invest more equitably, uh, especially for young families with children. Um, we ask in this project, what is driving this particular American exceptionalism? Uh, is it public opinion that the American public really wants older politicians and wants a welfare state that uh, disproportionately spends on older Americans? Uh, is it population demographics about the US? Is it something having to do with electoral and other political institutions in the US constitutional system? In this project, we really argue that none of those other explanations really carry that much water and really uh, the campaign finance system in the US, the particular way money in politics operates within the US political system helps to explain this per particular pattern in the US. So first, let's think about public opinion. So uh, it's pretty clear that public opinion is not what's uh, driving uh, the descriptive overrepresentation of older Americans in elected office or the policy outcomes around public spending and benefits uh, in the US. So here, there's a, a recent survey. Over 75% of the American electorate uh, want a maximum age limit for elected officials in this particular poll. And you might think, okay, who is, you know, which type of poll respondents are really pushing for this, right? Is it some sort of age-based resentment? No, actually, the age group that is less, that is the least concerned about this is Gen Z, 18 to 29 year olds. Uh, it's uh, individuals 30 and above, including those over 65, 74% uh, of which uh, uh, favor maximum age limits for elected officials. I thought that was, you know, incredibly, uh, you know, sort of fascinating pattern. I will also say, you know, so you see here that Americans in general, Gen X in that third group, and then uh, sort of uh, older baby boomers through the silent generation in the 65 plus group, they also have by far the me best music taste. So um, I think we can trust their uh, poll responses on it. I say this as a millennial, um, boomers and Gen X through the 70s, Motown sound, classic rock, funk, through the 90s hip hop, uh, grunge and sort of punk rock revolutions all absolutely dwarf millennial and Gen Z music, sorry to say. Um, it's not, so it's not public opinion, it's also not the demographics of the US that are driving this relationship. So this was a recent New York Times write up. Uh, we got, uh, myself and Adam Bonica got the chart of the week in uh, the New York Times, which was a funny honor and they format the charts much better, much prettier than we do in academic papers. But here you see on the X axis, uh, the median age of the population, and on the y-axis, uh, the average age of a federal lawmaker. And there you see the US sticks out tremendously. The US is actually compared to many uh, wealthy OECD countries, actually has a younger population, including a younger strictly US citizen population. This is not uh, driven by uh, you know, immigrant groups being younger in the US for the most part. Um, you see uh, places with younger median ages like Mexico, but no place has such a stark uh, uh, sort of uh, residual, I guess I would say, uh, difference between the average age of the population and the average age of their lawmakers. And you see even populations that are much older overall, uh, so places like Germany and Italy have much older, you know, uh, populations in general have much younger politicians. And in fact, Italy, the uh, average age of politicians is substantially younger than the average age of the population uh, sh you know, shown by which side of that 45 degree line they're on. So it's not demographics in the US that's explaining this pattern either. 
And we also think this is a much tougher question. You can't you know, uh, really exogenously assign, assign different constitutional institutions to societies. But here I'm highlighting uh, places with electoral systems and constitutional structures that match those of the US for the most part, uh, typically Anglophone uh, uh, Commonwealth countries like Australia, Great Britain, Canada. These have single member legislative districts which produce more candidate-centered elections than uh, elections in proportional representation parliamentary systems, which tend to be more party-focused, right? It could be that particular candidate-centered elections prioritize incumbency and then lead to politicians in the US being much older than those of other countries. But we see that these other countries with single-member district candidate-based elections and strong incumbency protection still have a much more uh, proportional sort of representation of the age groups in elected office. Um, so we turn to this other explanation. Uh, we think it might be money in politics driving a lot of this relationship. And in general, some of my additional research looks at money in politics uh, and sort of representational and other participatory inequality in the campaign finance system by race and by gender, for example. So women and people of color are uh, very underrepresented in uh, the American uh, donor population as well. And that can explain a little bit of these groups underrepresentation in elected office. Um, so in general, inequality in political participation is a strong uh, explanation for inequality of representation in descriptively in who politicians are and in policy outcomes. And in the US, especially campaign contributions are an important form of political participation compared to those uh, systems in other countries that may do campaign finance through political parties and have much stricter regulation on how money is used in politics. In this project, what we do is we, for the first time, estimate sources of campaign contributions uh, in some extensions by race and gender. But today, really focusing on age, we find uh, the age of every participant in federal politics, all voters, all donors, all candidates for federal office, and all sitting federal politicians. Uh, we back out their age through various record linkage uh, and statistical procedures. And then we show really how skewed the American donor population and money in politics is. Um, and we then make this argument of how you know, economic and political inequality really are co-constitutive and our feedback loops, right? This is hard to uh, get at any snapshot in time. But in general, greater economic power, and the US has a, a, a large wealth and income inequality across the generations helps to uh, explain political inequality and vice versa. Political inequality and representation further can exacerbate or maintain uh, sort of economic and other forms of inequality in society. So let's go through some of the argument. So uh, to get our data, we, as I mentioned, we link campaign finance data and voter file data from these national voter files to get the age of donors, voters, and candidates. Um, we find, just to preview the findings, uh, really extreme age gaps in, uh, in these forms of participation, including voting. And we'll talk a little bit about primary election voting especially. But most in terms of big dollar donations. Large donors are the most age skewed of any participants in American politics. Then we show, you know, does this really matter? It may not matter if donors across age groups it might not matter if older people dominate campaign finance if older and younger people want the same things out of politicians. But we showed no, that they really do not. And donors really do prioritize spending and funding can, uh, political candidates who are s of similar age, in large part because they see them as you know, dealing with similar concerns and uh, you know, generally agree on sort of uh, policy agendas. And this creates a huge disadvantage for younger candidates trying to get into the political system that I'll talk about. We then go through uh, some sort of counterfactuals where uh, we show that campaign finance regulation, alternative campaign finance uh, types of policies, how they would likely change the age distribution of money in politics, and then may advantage and disadvantage different types of candidates, and what Congress might look like under different uh, you know, the age distribution of Congress might look like under different campaign finance policy. And that was my first foray into real like structural economic uh, simulation so we can uh, 
you know, I learned a lot of calc doing that. Um, so I'd love to nerd out with you on that. Um, okay. So the data, we do this record linkage algorithm that I'll talk about in the next slide, but Bonica's famous dime data, I think is one of the cleanest sort of federal uh, money and politics data sets using the Federal Elections Commission uh, federal data on all campaign donations. Uh, and we merge that with record linkage algorithms with uh, this national voter file from the commercial firm L2 that has all voter registered voters um, and their sort of turnout history. Um, we do this, and uh, through these record linkages, we can back out birth years for voters from voter registration forms, donors as well from finding them in the voter files, as well as congressional candidates and members of Congress from their candidate filings and linking those candidate filing uh, sort of records to the FEC and voter file data because uh, the candidates themselves are registered to vote. Can I uh, absolutely. That's right. So, so we merge that. Yeah, that's proprietary commercial data from L2, which is like a little, you know, I don't think it's the most ethical, but we can do this. In my other work, the smartphone commercial data gets me like average wait times to vote through people's geolocations and things like that. So I actually would suggest, you know, like a, maybe more regulation of these commercial data sets. But through smartphone data and you know, it has people's magazine subscriptions and things like that, uh, these commercial firms have people's uh, dates of birth. And you're confident that's accurate? Yeah, I'm pretty confident that that's accurate. And most, uh, uh, I would say there's very few states without the birthday. Um, I'd like to check on that. But I, if I remembered, it was only like one of the Dakotas, which doesn't have voter registration uh, you know, as a system in general. But otherwise, you have to be, yeah. yeah. And that's the reason it doesn't have birth year, yeah. But I should check. That would be actually a great sort of placebo check. Make sure that South Dakota doesn't look weird for us, yeah. Um, you said North Dakota. I can't remember. I'm now thinking it might be South Dakota. Um, so unlike earlier work, including my own, on questions like this of, for example, racial representation in money and politics. So in recent years, uh, Act Blue and Win Red, if you've heard of these websites, they aggregate donations to candidates. And you mostly donate to candidates online now, especially small donors. This puts automatically files those uh, contributions into the FEC data, whereas traditionally the actual itemization requirement, you have to have given a total of over $250 to show up in the FEC data. Otherwise, candidates are not required by law to disclose who those small donors are. But because it's uh, nearly all through the internet now, this is automatically filed. So this gives us, I think, opens up a whole new window to study uh, campaign finance because small donors, we think the size of donation is very related to age. So without these small donors, I think we'd have a very skewed picture of uh, money and politics by age. So let's talk more about this record linkage. Uh, so we develop a new algorithm for record linkage. So we query each of the 23 million unique donors in the FEC data into the voter file. And then we construct this similarity metric between their records in the campaign finance data and the voter file uh, based on their name. And it's used, uh, there's this, what's called the Jero Winkler algorithm is sort of like how similar are these names? And it penalizes different letters and uh, 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 different like loss functions of you know, how far off you know, due to a typo or something does this have to be. And it gives us probabilistic sort of estimates of how likely are these potential matches with many matches. We then supplement that uh, with a database of nicknames for like, you know, Robert and Bob and things like that. If somebody donates under Bob, but their, you know, voter registration is under Robert. We uh, adjust based on name frequency to give greater weight to uncommon name pairings. Um, it's a lot easier to find somebody with an uncommon name like myself than you know, finding John Smith, who could be many John Smiths. We similarly construct a geographic similarity metric based in the voter registration address and the campaign you know, donation address based on, again, a series of sort of the address-related variables. Um, we then filter out addresses with two individuals of the same name and check if it's father, son, 
father-son pairs with this, you know, Bob and Bob Jr. or not, and in which case it may be a duplicate. So we do a ton of work on this record linkage algorithm and su successfully identify 17.7 million donors and 11,575 uh, federal candidates uh, over recent election cycles. And we do some checks to make sure that we did really find a representative group of uh, you know, individuals linked in these records. And here you see we plot a, a sort of commonly used ideology measure based on people's camp campaign contributions and show some descriptive statistics up top of individuals who we could not find a match for them in the data. And uh, we see that they're pretty similar. Uh, we are most heartened by that the average uh, you know, percent of them that are not linked who are retired or are student listed in their occupation. When you donate money, you have to list an occupation and an employer. Um, individuals who say they're retired or students, which are highly indicative of their age, are pretty similar in the linked and unlinked smaller samples. So we're pretty confident about this. In the appendix, we do some sensitivity things to see how off our main estimates would be. And it's uh, uh, pretty tight sort of confidence intervals in that simulation. But yeah, question. Slide, you said 23 million donors. Now mm -hmm. you've got, you know, uh, 13 million. 17, 17 million. million yeah. This is in. This is just in 2020. Um, and these are unique donors. These are unique donors, right? Um, this is just for 2020. Um, and this is. This goes back more years. This goes back uh, through 2016. But interestingly, like the number of donations in 2020 because of the internet donations goes up. You know orders of magnitude almost, which is quite surprising. Like the number of small donors brought in, in part due to the internet, and in part, like in the Trump era, there's much more small donor participation. And we're going to focus, because we don't have the small donors in those earlier years, like I'm really going to focus on 2020 as a key year here. But here's our, our sort of descriptive finding that I think is like an important set of descriptive findings on the median and average po uh, ages of participants in American politics. So first, we find members of Congress, like you saw in the first slide. So they have a median age of 59. These are members of Congress. Political candidates running, just below, have a median age of 58 years old. And then you get to donors. The median age of a dollar-weighted donor, so the median age of a dollar coming in in American politics is 66 years old. And that's uh, the most important sort of descriptive estimate here is that the median dollar in American politics comes from a 66-year-old. When you weight donors equally, right, a small donor counts as much as a big donor, then the median age is 59, closer to the median age of, uh, or the same median age as members of Congress. Um, voters in primary elections are also f median age 59. This is a new finding that primary election voters uh, themselves are also, you know, generally much older than, uh, you know, eligible voters in the American public. General elections, which bring in a much more representative electorate, down to a median age of 52. And non-voters, who are more numerous than voters, about 50% of Americans tend to vote in presidential elections a little more in recent elections. But non-voters have a median age of 39. This is a very, uh, you know, uh, Non-voters, uh, between non-voters and general election voters is the median American of, in their mid-40s. But non-voters are uh, quite skewed young, you see there in that histogram. So what does this really mean, that median age of a dollar coming in in American politics being 66? When we think about this, so you know, I just showed how unequal also voting in primaries and voting in general elections are, right? But let's see sort of the representational weight of different activities compared to 18-year-olds. So a value of 1 means that you, in your age group, do this the same amount as 18-year-olds. A value of 2 means you know, you're twice as likely to, for example, vote than an 18-year-old right? if your age group gets a 2. And here we see that when it comes to voting, those lines at the bottom show the most skew you see is that 75-year-olds in primary elections are about five times more 
prevalent in the electorate per capita than 18-year-olds. That's a big inequality there. But it's nothing like money in politics. 70 to 80-year-olds are almost 300 be times better represented in money in politics than 18-year-olds. That dwarfs, absolutely dwarfs the inequalities we see in voting, which themselves are quite stark. So how does this matter in actual representational politics? The first finding is that younger candidates are really disadvantaged. The most important money in an election cycle is early money when you get selected to be a viable candidate or not. Okay? Less money you know, can really thrust a candidate from viable to unviable in the early stages after filing to run for office and run in a primary election. Right? So usually in a general election, money at the margin really matters. Uh, but, you know, it's, there's much more spending uh, and there's much more going on in a general election, especially partisanship, right? So uh, in a general election, things like if you're running for the U.S. Congress, whatever is happening in the presidential election is going to affect you a lot in this general election. There's many more forces. But in a primary election, really, your first 30 days of fundraising, and Adam Bonica has a great a uh, book with my SN and set of papers on this, but why are there so many lawyers in American politics is another key question. And he finds that lawyers, uh, unlike other, including other business people, we get some doctors, uh, you know, uh, some specialists, you know, who make it to Congress, and occasionally, back in the day, you might get like a union shop steward. A uh, member from the working class, you might get, uh, you know, occasionally there's a PhD or two that tries to run for office, like Elizabeth Warren or something. Um, they're not as successful. They don't run as often, and they don't win as often as lawyers. And why is this the case? It's because lawyers tap their Harvard Law classmates and their uh, firm, you know, colleagues, fellow partners for this early fundraising. They have a social network of close individuals with a lot of money who can thrust them into being a viable candidate to be competitive in a primary election. After, and uh, the rest is sort of out of their control in you know, the waves of general elections and so forth. And we show that this is especially true uh, uh, not only of lawyers, but young candidates also lack these sort of social networks uh, that can thrust them into a viable candidacy. First. In terms of seed funding, the early donors in primary elections that really shape the pool of viable candidates. And second, with self-funding, right? You uh, can donate your own campaign, a lot of your money. Younger people have uh, less disposable wealth and therefore have less fun, uh, self-fundraising. And we see this, that seed funding and self-funding is even more unequal than the inequalities of money in politics uh, I just showed before. So here's some regressions. Uh, uh, within district analyses, so we're not comparing across more or less expensive districts, right? Running in the Deep South is a lot cheaper than uh, running in New England, for example, for a uh, seat in Congress. But what we find in this first analysis is that 30 years of candidate age, right, the difference between a candidate who's 30 and who's 60, uh, creates an 8.5 year sort of age difference in their first seed donors in the first 30 days after filing for office. The average seed donation is about $200 larger for that 60-year-old candidate than that 30-year-old candidate. And that 60-year-old candidate, on average, does five times more self-funding than that 30-year-old candidate. This is a huge deal that explains uh, the skew of sort of uh, candidates who make it uh, not just all the way to office, but even just as viable candidates in a primary election in the US. And then here, OK, we saw seed donors clearly uh, matter here, where older candidates have older and larger seed donors. Older candidates have more self-fundraising. But overall, is fundraising shaped and structured by age in American politics? Do older donors value who are you know, the lion's share of money in politics, do they value all else equal older candidates compared to younger candidates? Let's see some sort of flows of money between generations. So what this plot shows on the left is generations of donors and on the right generations of candidates. So we see, you know, the largest sort of set of money comes from the baby boomer generation followed by, uh, you know, silent generation and just behind the silent generation is Gen X. Millennials are becoming a growing share of uh, 
uh, campaign contributions. And then you see where the money goes towards candidates. And you see the bigger flows tend to go within generations. So baby boomers have by far the largest chunk of their money also going to baby boomer candidates here. This is descriptive. And we see in terms of total money, um, you know, Gen Z should be on this plot, but they donate so little money that it actually does not show up on the plot at all. And uh, we may uh, shortly have our first Gen Z member of the House uh, in the coming election cycles, but they don't show up uh, you know, as candidates who last past 30 days in the filing, uh, uh, after filing for office in the 2020 election we're looking at here. And then let's summarize this a little bit easier. There's a very strong relationship between donors' birth years on the x-axis and candidate birth years on the y-axis. So this is each candidate's average donor age. And you see a candidate born in the 1960s has an average donor who was born in the 1920s or 30s. Right? So older candidates tend to rely on even older donors. And then the youngest candidates here, born in the 1970s, uh, uh, have donors that are uh, born much later on average. But we need to look at this more systematically. There's all types of uh, you know, moving pieces where uh, older and younger people live in different districts, different parts of the country, urban and rural areas. There are many uh, sort of confounding factors that may lead to that descriptive relationship between donor age and candidate age. But here, uh, we, what we do is a, a within district design and then later, even more importantly, a within donor design. So because there's so, much, so many contributions in politics, we can do something, uh, a, a statistical model that tries to back out, OK, some donors really like donating and donate a lot. right? Some candidates are really good at attracting money. Here we can essentially like control for that with donor and candidate fixed effects in what's called a full dyadic data set. So like a model of trade, right, where we say, OK, we need an observation for the US and China. Then we need another one for the US and Canada. Then China and Canada, right? A fully dyadic data set like this taught me a bunch of comp computer science as well. So this already I told you we had you know, 17 million donors, 17.7 .7 million donors. Right? That's not just contributions. That's individual donors. Each of them, on average, makes a handful of donations. And you have thousands of candidates. What we did in this is created a dy dyadic data set of every contribution between all donors and candidates in this dyadic data set. So that becomes you know, rows in the spreadsheet in the billions. And it taught me how to use, for example, JAGs to code because R couldn't handle this large data set, even with the supercomputing clusters. So I credit this with uh, you know, next stop computer science. Um, but here we're seeing, OK, does the age distance between a donor I and a candidate C matter here. That is, once we back out sort of the average amount a donor contributes and the average amount a candidate receives, does the distance in age between a donor and a candidate matter? So let's check it out. So first, uh, we did this uh, more basic within district analysis that looks at the relationship between the average, uh, between a candidate's age and their average donor age, right? And that shows some things. And it shows that uh, uh, incumbency matters a little bit, too, where uh, incumbents have older donors in general. That makes sense. Incumbents tend to be older. But more importantly, we do this within donor results uh, here. And you see uh, this just separated between uh, Democrats and Republicans. But these negative estimates, what they mean is that the smaller the age distance between a donor and a candidate, the more likely that donor is to donate. So what do these results mean in substantive terms? A 30-year difference in age between a potential donor and a candidate causes a reduction of half of the likelihood that that donor gives to that candidate. Okay? So any given candidate you have a very low chance of donating to on your own, about a 0.2% for all people who give at least two donations in a year. right? But that goes down by half if you are 30 years in age difference from that candidate. 
Okay, that's actually a pretty substantial amount. Um, donors are more likely to give within the same state and all of this, but the point here is that when you back out how much donors are into donating and how much candidates uh, do at raising funds, you get a really stark sort of prioritization of, uh, of, of age proximity with a candidate. And here you can break it out by generation because the middle generation, Gen X, has both, can donate both older or younger, whereas Gen Z can only donate older and the silent generation can only donate younger, right? So that might make some mathematical quirks. But here what you just see is that uh, this is pretty consistent across age generation here. Everybody cares about donor proximity. You're being sort of age proximate to a candidate. But the real sort of big money question pun um, is whether more age equality in money and politics would change something about politicians or downstream poli uh, sort of policy and political outcomes, right? We think about this when we think about turnout gaps. Latino Americans vote uh, at lower rates than other ethnic groups, and that's a key explanation for the underrepresentation of Latinos in American politics. Big underrepresentation of younger individuals in money and politics. Would this change anything if? we had a more uh, sort of uh, representative di age distribution of campaign donors in American politics. First, we show that indeed older donors are quite different from younger donors in what they care about and prioritize. So you guys know already that uh, younger generations are more progressive and more likely to vote for Democrats than older generations. But I was surprised really how stark this is and how stark it is in campaign contributions. So this is an ideology measure we develop uh, based on Adam Bonica's measures. But this takes the distribution of how people donate and backs out sort of their ideology score on a left-right scale. It's not perfect, but it kind of represents the average ideological position. Um, with smaller values being more liberal, higher values being more conservative. And you see really stark uh, ideological differences between the generations of donors here based on how they donate. Um, in 2020, 90% of millennial and Gen Z donors who are higher income than the average millennial and Gen Z individual donated to Democrats. This has never before been seen, such a stark sort of age relationship with ideology and partisanship in political participation, right? Um, in terms of voting, Gen Z votes more like 70-30 for Democrats, but in donations, it's 90-10, including millennials. So this is younger professionals. This is younger individuals in the tech industry, younger uh, lawyers, doctors, uh, you know, budding college professors. PhDs take too long. They're not professors. But uh, you know what I'm saying. They're the young professional managerial class especially from more uh, knowledge economy jobs in more urban metro areas. And they're donating overwhelmingly to Democrats. And this is not changing. Those are cohort effects. And unlike life cycle effects, everybody gets a bit more conservative as you age, as you have children, own a home, uh, you know, retire, are on fixed incomes, uh, you care more about crime. And uh, there's all sorts of reasons for these life cycle effects. But what we're seeing is these cohort effects now are very strong. Millennials and especially Gen Z are remaining more left and more, demo and more sort of participatory in favor of the Democratic Party than we would have expected from the life cycle evolution of earlier generations. I think this is the untold story of conflict over democracy and institutions right now is age polarization. We have never in American political history, and as long as the modern sort of recorded public opinion era, that maybe goes back 75 years, we have not seen anything like this before. Um, this is uh, true on like major political questions. We're seeing increased polarization. The Republican Party to remain competitive will have to do something to attract these young sort of wealthy professionals. So how could policy change the age distribution of money in politics? So there's a number of uh, constitutional and now in the contemporary Supreme Court unconstitutional policy reforms around campaign finance. So one is, uh, aggregate limits. How much can you donate total to all candidates combined uh, in, in a given election cycle? That used to be about $43,000 you were allowed to give to all federal candidates combined in an election cycle. 
that was an aggregate limit. The McCutcheon v. FEC Supreme Court case after Citizens United struck that down so there are no more aggregate limits in money in politics. But let's imagine an alternative Supreme Court would allow this. Few young donors came anywhere close to those pre-McCutcheon limits in recent post-McCutcheon election cycles, okay? Few young donors give anywhere near what the previous $43,000 aggregate limit was. What that suggests is, you know, the people that would be susceptible to that maximum aggregate limit are older individuals, and the sort of share of money in politics would skew a bit younger if we had aggregate limits. Individual limits still exist. To a particular electoral federal candidate, you can give up to $2,900 per election cycle. Um, young people rarely reach this uh, $2,900 limit. We also think individual limits, uh, holding them constant or uh, making them more restrictive, would also make uh, money in politics a bit younger. Small donor matching programs have been debated. They uh, uh, hit the agenda in 2018 and 2019 with the HR1 bill proposed a small donor matching system where if you donate $50 or less, there's some sort of multiplier match from public financing. Young donors tend to be smallest. The small donors, if, you know, again, assuming uh, that people don't strategically shift their uh, donation size here, uh, in you know strong ways, small donor matching would also sort of youngify the donor base a bit as well. And then finally, what we do in our sort of structural uh, you know analysis is we look at a potential voucher program, which is considered constitutional in the current jurisprudence. A voucher program says, unlike strict public financing, uh, voucher programs say uh, individuals get a all registered voters in an area get a sort of donation credit, right? In Seattle, there's a program like this uh, that McCabe and uh, Jennifer Herwig have studied uh, that increased a bit of the sort of diversification of the donor base in Seattle. But what this program does is it gives everybody $100 worth of credits that you can distribute across all local candidates, but this could be done federally. And candidates agree either to go into the voucher system and only take voucher money or they remain in the private fundraising system. In Seattle, most of the local candidates went into the voucher system. Despite the voucher system being really underutilized, right, the participation, it's actually kind of an annoying website. I worked at UW, went there. It was like kind of an annoying website and understood why people didn't click through. We also don't know much about local candidates. That's a whole separate issue I study. Um, but there, uh, there is some evidence of some uh, diversification from even this modest program. And just to uh, uh, you know, dramatize this a bit more, here is the distribution of donor, of contributions by size and by age. So really what you should look at is that far right, the one distribution that's pretty different is that under $200 donation skews much younger. It has that hump, that red line on the right of the you know, more recent uh, birth ages. Y small donations are really the only ones that are more age representative. And once you get individuals that donate, for example, above the $46,200 previous McCutcheon limit in purple there, it's skewed uh, heavily much older. So what we do in this structural uh, analysis here is we say, OK, let's take all demographic information we have about all individuals in the American electorate in the voter file. Let's imagine we created a voucher program in which people used vouchers at a similar propensity that they do to turn out to vote. And we understand their preferences for which candidates they donate to based on the, their actual distribution of money in politics in the current system. Okay. Um, you can look in the paper on uh, more details and things like that. But the point here is to say, what would money in politics look like and candidate fundraising look like under a voucher program that maybe over time people learn to use at about the same rate that they turn out to vote? And what we do here is under this hypothetical voucher program, here we plot different candidates, those dots, by candidate age uh, with older candidates over there on the right, younger candidates as young as 25 on the left. And we show the log difference of their fundraising on this counterfactual voucher program here. So a zero 
means that you raise about the same amount under this voucher program as you would uh, in, a, uh, in our traditional campaign finance system. If you have a estimate below zero, you're a candidate who earns less under this voucher program than you would in the private money system. And what we show here is, I was surprised by this, but it's really only candidates above 67 years old that are disadvantaged under this voucher program. It's really uh, the oldest candidates who are raising a ton of money uh, whose sort of overall fundraising would go down. And candidates below 67 would be advantaged, but the youngest candidates uh, advantage the most there. And you see the dots are sparser. There really are fewer candidates of those younger ages. So this uh, you know, retains sort of the overall amount of money sloshing around in the uh, money system. But we think really any of these campaign finance reforms would probably have a substantial effect on the distribution of uh, sort of money in politics. OK, so overall, Political and economic power in politics and political economy are mutually reinforcing. So groups that start out with a lot of economic resources can use those economic resources to advantage themselves in politics, which begets more economic resources. This is a feedback cycle uh, within civilizations over long stretches of time. We can think about this you know, of all sorts of demographic and social constellations by you know, incumbent uh, religious groups, uh, we can think about uh, large landowners as societies become more democratic over history and so many other forms of this. Campaign finance in the US is especially important compared to uh, money and politics in other countries. And it's highly unequal by race, gender, and age. Please see my other papers for the race and gender uh, analyses there. But similarly, uh, you know, uh, women are, uh, white women are underrepresented in money and politics by a factor of two or so. Uh, men of color by about a factor of four, but women of color are, are underrepresented in American politics money uh, by about a factor of 11 compared to their share of the population. It's quite stark, much starker than gaps in voting. We think it has something to do with the representational gaps we see in political representation and outcomes. And in this, really, donors do appear to value age representation, so we think this really matters. What explains this overall here? We plot the total share of wealth uh, of each generation on the x-axis and the total share of money and politics on the y-axis. And we show that this uh, is a pretty tight relationship. The baby boomers have uh, uh, about half of wealth, uh, of overall wealth in American society, and have a bit more than half of their, the share of total US money and politics. The silent generation and Gen X in the middle down there, uh, millennials uh, growing, growing group, but again, right on that 45 degree line, have about 5% of American wealth and 5% of total donations. If we wanted to shift these, they would probably shift on the line is the point, right? So we do think a more represent, representative political system and, and political economy in the US might make wealth across generations a bit more equal. Um, and that uh, sort of these are feedbacks between them, uh, economic and political power. So overall, uh, further, I think there are real reasons to care about this in terms of American democracy and democratic performance. There are life cycle and cohort reasons that you shouldn't just say, OK, let's wait for younger people to age into power. And everybody gets their turn once they're around retirement age. Everybody gets their turn to run the US political system. That is not a viable solution. First, for life cycle reasons, this might mean there's a chronic underinvestment in young people with real human capital implications. Right? We might be chronically underinvesting, for example, in raising children, in uh, education for younger individuals and things like that that may leave American society weaker than it otherwise would. There are also cohort reasons, reasons specific to different generations, why we can't wait for different generations to age into power. One is that millennials, and especially Gen Z, are much more racially diverse, more likely to be children of immigrants, uh, and face different incidents of recessions, climate effects, even potentially democratic decline than other generations. Generations have unique experiences that deserve to be represented in politics and unique insights. Um, finally, age is really underemphasized under in scholarship on American democracy. And I think it's just, you know, 
conflict over American democracy more broadly. Uh, it has gotten a huge amount of attention on uh, racial and demographic threat in terms of immigration and a diversifying population. But an underemphasized point is that these things overlap and map really onto generational change and help explain overall sort of partisan battles over democratic institutions, things like gerrymandering and voter suppression, battles over voting on college campuses, which happen between the parties, right? But also within party conflict, like we're seeing on key issues now in universities and media firms and uh, within tech corporations and real differences in attitudes about gender and race and you know, criminal justice and really fundamental uh, Israel and Palestine and fundamental political values really vary by age. And we're seeing increased conflict of this sort. And how American democracy proceeds is really about whether the US political system can sort of weight and aggregate all these very distinct preferences and come up with uh, solutions based on like, what do most people want, right? Um, that's, you know, that'd be great. Um, uh, this is especially important in uh, primary elections as well. Um, and I'll just close with uh, my co-author uh, likes doing these AI, uh, AI sort of images here. And this was an alternative sort of cover slide for us uh, representing the American political system. Uh, uh, thanks so much for your time. Looking forward to um, Q&A. Thank you. So because this is recorded, people can see the recording sure to talk into mics, so just raise your hand and I'll pass out mics. I don't know if we should start with one of the older people. <laughs> you have so many best advantages taste, already. The best taste in music, <laughs> like I said. But I'm old, but dis distinguished. <laughs> nice. My question is simply, how do you track dark money? Oh, great question. So the uh, question is, how do I track dark money? So uh, unfortunately, we don't. It's dark and it's uh, unfortunate. That's one of the main sort of parts of Citizens United is not just that, you know, new flows of money are allowed, but also that they don't have to disclose the origins of donors in particular combinations of donating to, to 501c4 organizations, which can donate to super PACs and are ostensibly not coordinated uh, with political uh, candidates or parties. And there, I would say, first, I uh, have a grad student. I'm extremely proud. So I'm you know, becoming a senior myself. And now I'm extremely proud of my PhD student, Rachel Funk Fordham, who recently published a piece in Legislative Studies Quarterly on Citizens United. Um, and she uses a difference in differences design because pre-existing state laws on campaign finance varied, where some states kind of had a more Citizens United-like system before, and some really restricted. Uh, money in politics and Citizens United opened up the floodgates in some states more than others. That statistically allows her to study the effects pretty well, causally, I think. And there she shows that uh, not only did Citizens United make uh, it helped elect more Republicans to the state level. It made those Republicans more conservative than earlier generations of Republicans. And in the downstream effect, it weakened uh, sort of democratic institutions and caused more gerrymandered legislative maps, uh, more restrictions on the franchise, and so forth. So Citizens United had a huge deal. But we can't trace sort of the actual money mechanisms. We can just say, OK. You open up the floodgates, and this, will, this is what happens. But I would say, in terms of this, it's hard to believe that dark money would skew younger than the you know, hard money that we can trace is the sort of short answer to that. But I, I have to say how important there's this, I don't know. At the time in the early 2010s, there was this debate. Some people were saying Citizens United is everything, right? This is the destruction of American democracy. Other sort of counterintuitive types, like, no, money in politics doesn't matter at all. The answer is in the middle. Citizens United had a very large effect, but you know, it's not a, didn't fundamentally break American democracy, but had major effects, yeah. Thanks, Jake. This was really fantastic. So thought-provoking oh, and so careful. I learned Thank you. so much. Um, That's very my, generous. Thank you. Well, it is deserved. Um, my question is really to, it's one about American politics and more to kind of take you beyond America a little and to take you to that first graph that you showed in which the US kind of second to Cambodia was you know, the, the kind of puzzle that you begin with and then open up. And here, I was struck by the fact that in this graph as well, and I think in one, um, maybe a couple of slides down, you see that the US, I mean, so 
you know, of course, it's, it's really kind of holding up the right-hand side, but a lot of other countries also have a kind of similar issue of kind of electing legislators who are far older than the median age. Right. And here, it's just legislator age, right? So if you actually kind right. of control for what the median age of the population is, which I think you do in one of those scatter plots, right. where you don't have India there, but India has the world's youngest population. Oh, interesting. It's in, I mean, the median age of India, um, you know, I'm sure someone can correct me if I'm wrong, is in the 20s, wow. right? Wow. It's the world's youngest population. And so if you put that in there, my yeah. kind of guesstimate there is that India is probably up there with the United States. Right, as more skewed, yeah. As, as much more skewed. And yeah. the other interesting thing that comes out from the scatter plot is the other countries that you do have that similarly kind of are above right there, right, are Japan and South Korea. And so there's something about India, Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, Cambodia, and you know, I'm just kind of curious, A, because this is obviously an American politics talk with such an America-specific explanation, but given that this is, A, both a phenomena that is clearly beyond mm -hmm. the United States, I was wondering like how you might think that might travel, and then how you might think of just this observation that the other countries that are up there are these countries in which a number of these kind of world value survey type cultural attitudinal questions would say there's a lot of respect for the elderly? Uh, or it's a kind of, you know, deeply ageist culture in many ways? Like, I'm just wondering right. how that kind of might figure into an explanation. And relatedly and finally, do we have any survey data on what Americans think of this kind of, um, what is it, gerontocracy? gerontocracy. Yeah. What a great set of questions. First, I would say, like, this is why it's so great to come meet great uh, you know, comparative scholars, because there's so much, that, like, really, yeah, I do area studies. I, I'm a comparativist to area studies, focus on one region, I guess. But, uh, no, I would say this is fascinating. So here we do see India on this, where the average, you know, federal politician age is like high, sort of 56 or so. That's incredibly higher than 20-something. Um, but, I, I like, what was really interesting in your explanation is that, like, actual cultural differences may explain this for countries like Japan, Korea, and India, where there's deference to older individuals and culture, potentially, partially. Thailand, Cambodia, yeah. just, well, these so, are disproportionately up there. So Cambodia has a young population, but a very older, but it's a non-democracy that is based in a long-standing regime. That, so that's a pretty, I think that's a unique explanation to um, Cambodian authoritarianism over the years and uh, sort of uh, uh, where it's these other democracies, I think, that are a really clear puzzle, although Cambodia like, has a really, that's an important explanation, um, and I should think more about it, but it, it does appear to be given like, you know, long-term authoritarianism. But these other democracies, um, Japan, South Korea, India, uh, deference to older people. One thing at traveling around the world you see is in the US in survey estimates, people don't respect elders in the US. Like it's not a country with deference towards older individuals culturally. You see this in pop culture where only in the US are the like children's TV shows like so fine like the older people are always stupid enemies. Like all the TV shows I watched growing up, it's like the kids outsmart the stupid parents. And that you go to any other country, like that is not a thing. Like usually I was watching like, you know, study abroad in like in Spain and I'm watching like, the kid, you know, some kids shows and it's just like, oh yeah, like, the you know, like thank you wise elder, like you solved our problem, you know? And it's really a different sort of culture. So I would say the US, like this is consistent with the US having some institutional or policy related reason. Whereas these others, like I really like that explanation that they're, maybe something cultural, but I'd also love to hear more specifically about India and the way uh, sort of how elites rise out of the mass public to, you know, serve in politics and things like that. That would be interesting as well. Finally Please. Say that I think actually your explanation does travel to India in some ways. Because okay. I think the major changes to campaign finance would actually allow you to look at it. So I would encourage you to look at India as someplace actually where an argument like this could that sounds great. And in money and politics research, the only other, like the one I see a lot is Brazil has good data. And like we've done some analysis of race and representation in Brazil, of Afro-Brazilians and things in money. Um, but I would like to I'd think about that in Brazil as well. Great call. Oh, 
Um, so we have a colleague, Jim Marone, he's retiring this year, and he always asks two questions at talks. And so now I'm the most uh, senior person in the department um, in terms of longevity, um, and I'm gonna take that prerogative. So, and I can talk to you in the reception uh, afterwards. So I, I have a couple of, so I have some technical things. So we know from work by Larry Bartels, which is, you know, Really, the frame of this talk is really both democracy for realists, but also unequal democracy, right. the second edition for Larry Bartels. And we have Nimi and Jennings, and you sort of dismiss the cohort effect from Nimi and Jennings, I think, too casually. Okay. Um, so I think that there needs to be more years to study, mm -hmm. you know, your, your group at 30 and your group at 45 and see where they are on spending in particular. So I haven't seen any data that says that actually has changed except for the shifting of college educated voters into the Democratic Party, which tends to be more liberal. Right. Um, but so that's one kind of thing. Um, I'm going to have three things. Two things is. Um, women, um, uh, women are now, your, your, di your diagram's okay, you know, it's like, um, Miranda can help me, but uh, f they're a quarter of the House, right? right, essentially the House and Senate, not, not, not barely a quarter. And women have traditionally gone into politics much older after they've had children, right. because that was a societal expectation. It's only really 2018 that the average or median age of newly elected women has yes. gone down. Right. So in your world, we would have excluded or not been able to elect a lot of women who came into politics much later on average than men. So I'm not sure that would have produced a better representative outcome. Uh, I mean, the, the, the gist of your whole paper is that, you know, the world would be better if younger people were better represented, um, at least in campaign donation, because they'd have a better shot at, um, at being elected to office and the priorities of the parties would change. I don't fundamentally disagree that people should move with the times, but if you look at the vast social welfare spending and you think about Medicaid, a program for the poor, but also the poor elderly, right? You think about social security and there's a lot of programs built into social security that aren't just the check right. for older people that help vast numbers of people that are younger than 60. So do you want to think about or have you and Adam thought about refining sort of the punchline here, because it, it strikes me that it's, it's too simplistic for the, as you well know from your book, the vast reach of all of the programs that are sustained by a system that is run by, I will euphemistically call them older people. So great questions and comments there. One, I would say absolutely, that uh, on gender and representation, absolutely, uh, these great new papers are showing so clearly that um, desire to run for office and propensity to run for office, uh, as well, it maps onto the econ papers on uh, gender earnings and things like that, but child raising absolutely creates this absolutely stark gap where women don't catch back up economically. Um, and uh, it's true that you see so fascinating, you know, you do see these in current politics, Gen X men with their young kids on the victory stage, Ron DeSantis is there with his young kids winning uh, Florida gubernatorial election. And you don't see that as much with women uh, during the time of having young kids. That's absolutely true. You know, Barack Obama serving as president with young kids, um, that is very much a male phenomenon. Uh, I think that's right. I would say, I, in looking overall, it was not that women were not older than men, um, even in the pre-2018 period. Um, so I don't think that some sort of campaign finance reform that makes the donor rate younger would have affected, I think in the earlier periods it would have had no effect on gender representation, which as you say, so racial representation post-civil rights, like black representation in Congress is now population parity. It's like a huge triumph of the po post-voting rights act era. Um, Latinos and Asian Americans have caught up and are not quite at population parity, but the gender gap is still about a 50% women, 50% of the population, about 25% of Congress. That's a huge deal still. Um, and like I said in the other work, very underrepresented, under, underrepresented in money and politics, which I do think helps explain that as well. Um, but I would say, so when we think about democracy and representation, when we think about, it, you know, when we think about political inequality in inputs and how that you know, sort of translates into inequality of political outputs, that's descriptive representation, who politicians are, and policy outcomes, I want to say it's true, like I you know, have previously studied, and the implementation of Medicare and previously Social Security, over 90% of seniors died in poverty prior to Social Security. This was an absolutely 
like a triumph of human civilization. And then later, Medicare 1965, uh, equally important not only for uh, 65 and older healthcare, it's an incredibly effective and efficient program that changed health outcomes dramatically. And also it helped end Jim Crow in the South by saying, Southern hospitals, if you want Medicare reimbursement, you have to desegregate uh, that desegregated hospitals in the South. This is one of the, these are like the two of the most important policies in human history, absolutely. But I would say these other welfare states also have programs for uh, families with children, for example, or for young kids. And Medicaid expansion has happened now. But young adults, like the Medicaid eligibility uh, in conservative states, you have to be beyond destitute and have children, right? Medicaid expansion said young adults who are working poor can get it, um, or families a little bit above the federal poverty line in these uh, sort of Medicaid expansion states. I would say just the spending is quite small as a share compared to other countries, which have these pen public pension systems in the Nordic countries, but also have uh, assistance um, for uh, children, uh, young adults of sort of the working poor age and so forth. So I would say that is possible. And I wouldn't say that it's not that young people, given their ideology and partisanship, we look at young people are not clamoring to cut Medicare and Social Security. They're clamoring to add additional right. uh, yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, there are 40 states with the expansion. So right. you're talking really about the Deep South. I mean, and it could skew a lot of things in the data, the Deep South. Right, the original yeah. VO key, 13 minus three states. But, Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to ask a, Please, yeah. a couple of questions, too. One is the, um, the, the degree of representational skew. And I'm curious, in light of your findings, what you make of that new Harvard poll that just came out from the Institute of Politics finding right surprisingly uh, looked at the priorities of yeah. young people uh, compared to other older Americans and found that what do they care about what's most important to them. Actually, they care pretty much the same thing exactly. everyone else does about inflation and health care and some exactly. of the things you would think young people would care about. Uh, Israel, Gaza, and student debt is very low. That's right. Climate was also pretty low. Housing may be a partial exception. So that's one. It, is, is, is the representational skew as much as we think? And then the second one is the degree to which this gerontocracy is really reinforcing itself throughout the political system, or is this, there are, in a pluralist system, yeah. there's many different ways of participating. This is one where older people are overrepresented, but there's other avenues of participation where they're not overrepresented. And so there's been a lot of commentary about the overrepresentation of young people on congressional staffs, on campaigns, and even though they're not principals, they're agents on social media, that there's a lot of avenues of politics where old people are not very present and young people maybe are overrepresented. So how do we think about that? Great questions. Uh, I would say one is, uh, so that's true, this new poll did show, yeah, inflation, uh, uh, you know, then various sort of economic topics uh, came out at the top, just, you know, very similar to all age groups. Um, I would say there's, it's interesting when you ask the question, you know, I'm not deep in the behavior scene, but when you ask the question about what's the biggest problem facing your generation, suddenly it does pop up the, you know, the sort of stereotypical things we uh, thought about. So climate, uh, I would say even in this new poll, gun issues are higher for younger individuals, but the other ones uh, absolutely are much more common across age groups. But when you ask what's the biggest problem facing your generation, people do uh, respond, younger individuals do respond, climate, guns, student debt. Um, but I would say, you know, people participate in politics on behalf of others too. You know, people care about their families of different ages and uh, things like that. So that could be one reason there's like different answers when you ask about uh, what's facing your generation. But yeah, I would say in these other areas, like young people have tremendous cultural power in the US. So, and uh, firms on TV, you see how advertising dollars are directed, absolutely directed towards right now millennials uh, especially. Um, it's really something wild to see yourself, you know, become mid late 30s and you're like, wow, like, they're really targeting me. Um, but I would say, uh, so some of it, overrepresentation of younger people on social media is only within younger people on TikTok, right? It's not observed by other age groups. Others like, you know, I would say does still skew, other media sources do skew a little older, but there's huge conflict now within newsrooms. So I would say like there was 
around 2020, the sort of uh, Black Lives Matter politics within uh, these legacy media firms was a fascinating conflict and editors talking about like insurgent groups of new, more racially diverse reporters really pushing back. There's conflict within NPR on these issues. So I think this is what, like, I'm just trying to point out, I'm not saying, and this goes back to Wendy's question as well, like, I would say, you know, this is social science, I'm not saying like necessarily anything is normatively better. I think if we care about, uh, you know, political equality, majoritarianism, we should think about these dimensions very carefully and that young people do tend to be underrepresented uh, in these representational outcomes. But I would also say like, I'm trying to just map what's going on in American politics in large part and this conflict is so stark and underemphasized, I think, in the literature, and just keep an eye out, is my point, like within organizations, institutions, and more broadly in electoral and other politics, age is a tremendously important cleavage. And it's fascinating that the discussions have really been around other things that correlate with age, right? Um, but that I just think this is emerging and we'll see as the time goes. But those cohort effects are really stark you know, with Gen Z being extremely different, and we see this uh, sort of at play, you know, as we speak, yeah. I have a question about, um, and I know this might veer too much in the behavior zone, but, um, but it might I'll not, give, I I'll know. give a good try. Um, so, so I have a question about, um, do we have any indication of why younger people with money spend so much less on politics? Right. Like, th for me, that was the most fascinating thing, right? Um, and that include like, if you go back, I mean, and I think that goes even to um, Gen X, and I wish you could yeah. also kind of yeah. split the cohorts too, because I think older Gen X is different right, than good point. younger Gen X. But I mean, but whatever, everybody forgets Gen X anyway. But <laughs> nice. um, yeah, great point. <laughs> never mind, exactly. ignore us, it's fine. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, but like, I'm very, very curious about that, right? Because we do have certainly um, Zennials and Millennials with money at this point. So why do they spend so much less on politics? Right. Um, and I wonder if we have any indications from public opinion surveys, like, do we ask about that? I don't know if we, I mean, I'm not aware of anything like that, but I wonder if you've encountered it in your research. Excellent question. I would say, first is that we're, you know, we're surprised that how close to this 45 degree line this was. So this is your share of total wealth. So that explains most of it, but there are some, you know, some more things to think about. Uh, you know, voting has costs, right? We have to take potentially time off work and, you know, deal with, kids and get ourselves to a polling place or get the mail ballot and there's various costs of time and information and effort but the you know voting age gaps is like uh, you know is not as explained by like how much money you earn being a homeowner earning more being more educated makes you much more likely to vote but even the wealth you know gen z and millennials vote considerably less so in the 2022 midterms you know it was 30 percent or so uh turnout under 35, and that was like an exceptional year, you know? That was the biggest midterm, besides 2018 and 2022 were the highest young turnout midterms since, uh, you know, over the past half century, and it's still like well below 40% turnout. Um, so there I would think there are different things about like feelings of efficacy and habits, right? Do you feel like your participation is meaningful? Um, here. Uh, it's like a feedback cycle, but uh, candidates, because they know they have to appeal to older donors, younger candidates must, to be competitive, tap some older donors. Older donors don't have to tap younger donors. And that's why you see, for example, fundraising events we have a little bit in the paper. They're at places that older people like to go. Like they're at you know, local older people restaurants and Cracker Barrels, and they're not at young like stereotypically young things, or Gen X, what is Gen, Gen X likes like the brewery the dog, that you can bring your dog to. I mean, that's... <laughs> What's that thing you all like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's not at places where younger people tend to be. Um, so that's why when exceptions to the rule happen, like a younger candidate who does tap a younger activist base, it's really off the regression line and something to, to think about. But, you know, I would like to ask you, but I would think, you know, feelings of efficacy, uh, feelings of like there are social aspects to politics. It's not all, inst we don't vote classically, you know, the cost of voting means like there has to be some social aspect to voting. It's not just your personal self-interest, right? Yeah. And I think that when you're around a community of 
similar individuals with similar concerns that can create sort of feedback effects of participation for a particular demographic group. So for you, it's just they have less. It's, it's not just. That's, I mean, that's our finding here in money in politics. But I would say, like, that doesn't explain this voting gap, which is so stark, too, because money in politics, you really need money to do it. Um, but I would also say, like you mentioned young, wealthy people. It is true. Like When we look at the millennials and Gen Z donors, like they are rich. But interestingly, a, a lot are like sort of heirs. And it's less, um, I was like, it's going to be like SBF and these like you know weird tech young people. But it's actually like a lot of young professionals. Um, and SBF types like use different build organizations and interest groups and use dark money and things like that. And then. Uh, there's a set of like you know, famous names, young people who are, who you wonder if they're like bund if they're bundling the way like spousal couples to kind of donate as teens. Yeah, great question, dude. SBF Sam Bregman Fried, the guy who's in jail now. Exactly, okay. got it. Exactly, he was um, young. He was young and he was rich, he was and he got young. involved in politics. <laughs> Terrific. Um, this is a fantastic project. Couple of questions. Thanks. One just building on on Wendy's question. Um, the, you had given a framing in this talk about how the material benefits tend mm -hmm. to go to the older people. Uh, and so it's not surprised they're essentially like buying the benefits for themselves right through American democracy. But if it's if the effect is driven by rich old people, then aren't they the ones who need the material benefits least? Right, they rely least on the welfare state to provide them uh, with benefits they need, or because they're wealthy so, otherwise. Can you complicate that for us in terms of yeah. what are they? Is it truly that, or is it really about like ideology and how the young people uh -huh. should work for it the way we did, and something a little more right. ideological? Um, secondly, can you tell us a more historical story? You know, when was the United States legislature the youngest right. relative to American yeah. demographics, and did that? Does it change that much? Did it really have any change? You, know, you gave an anecdote about the second youngest American president is the one who pushes uh, Medicare expansion. So maybe there's a story to tell about young legislators you know, driving the expansion of the safety net to younger generations. Um, does that hold in other cases? Uh, and lastly, can you just double tap, double click for us here? Because um, they, I think it was on your chart, but you didn't emphasize it much. What's the limits of this? Right. So we seem to be going up and up. In terms of the gerontocracy, um, you know, obviously the the polls you showed at the beginning are all driven by dissatisfaction with the two oldest president presidential candidates in history. Um, you know, at what point does it drop off? Right? At what point do even the boomers say this candidate is too old? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, great question. Um, uh, so this it's so great to come to communities like this and get these great questions. Like really. Uh, now, like these are really generative things. Like, I guess I'll start, um, you know, with the wealth begets wealth thing. So I would say, so it's hard to track sort of where welfare state spending goes in a national sense. It's hard to do that national accounting. But in the U.S., like the Suzanne Mettler style of you know submerged state really emphasize, and econ also emphasizes, like you have to think about taxes and transfers and things. But in the U.S., a huge amount of the welfare state is through the tax code. Um, and it prioritizes home ownership, for example. Um, so that's one part, and that is a big mechanism for how the welfare state prioritizes older people. Then secondarily, it's things like Social Security and Medicare as well. Um, and you know, like, so I would say the national accounting, like, it is very much clear that you know these individuals, you'd say rationally, you know, wealthier individuals like may need these less, but even very wealthy individuals need health care in the time of the greatest health need later in life, right? And uh, you know, social insurance is something like if you're very unlucky with health issues in later in life and you have to pay out of pocket, it's it's impossible for even up to the very, very pretty wealthy. So I would say these things um, it does make some sense to me, right? Uh, you know, and many donors are not, you know, what is rich in the U.S. is an eye of the beholder, but you know, people earning several hundred thousand dollars a year are like still at the top end of the income distribution in the U.S. And those individuals do seem to really care about uh, things like uh, a mortgage tax credit, Social Security, and Medicare. Uh, we're noticing, and that's why, um, you know. 
privatization of Social Security continues to fail, um, and cuts to Medicare are the third rail uh, for a reason there, and observed preferences. Um, historically, uh, you know, Nick Carnes from Duke uh, Policy School does such great work on descriptive representation uh, of the working class especially, but also other dimensions. And he shows uh, earlier time periods, it was organizations in American politics sort of tapped who's going to be a representative elite and parties in the pre sort of smoke filled room primary area pre McGovern Frazier reforms parties had a lot more power they would choose local business people um, and a lot more uh, people who are sort of union representatives and I think those sorts of mechanisms of picking candidates um, as undemocratic as smoke filled rooms were and you think about proportional representation like closed list party PR uh, which tend to be younger in like, you know, Denmark's president is half the age of Joe Biden. Um, and that is in part through like recruitment from key like segments of society um, that parties think would be good candidates rather than the type of person who can raise the most money. So in the American Congress was uh, much younger and it's really a post sort of 80s phenomenon that increases uh, over time to create this uh, unrepresentative um, age group. But then finally, what was the last, uh, that was a history part and then, uh, oh yeah, that was set age limit 70 was that polling question, but uh, I would love to do a more robust analysis. Yeah. So we have time for one more question Sounds and then great. we have a reception outside we can continue the conversation next. So Sounds great, thank you. Guys. Thanks so much, really fascinating talk. Um, maybe I'll try to squeeze two in. I, th I think one is, um, Sort of a question about what what this dynamic looks like at the level of state and local politics. Yeah. Is it the sort of same phenomena? Because I, I have a sense, right, that like maybe that that seems right, right, but that your your the marginal bang for your buck is greater at the sort of lower you go, right? Yeah. Like in my hometown, I think someone's on city council by winning with the frat vote, right? They, um, and so I wonder sort of what the broader implications then are for strategies for people who want to, like, should our focus be local to sort of have a project where we build representation from the ground up? Uh, you mentioned sort of the role of parties and other organizations. That's really interesting. And I guess on the sort of um, question of this sort of like dyadic relationship between um, like donor and candidate, I wonder if there is a, I think it's what the kids call like a thruple, but the sort of, <laughs> Sorry, sure, age. <laughs> no, but, but, but if you think about sort of in a primary context, right, where you have a choice between multiple candidates, so I'm thinking like Ed Markey, and right, 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 right. Which one, Patrick Kennedy, or the? But where there is, right, where there yeah. are large age gaps in terms of who I could choose to, like, right. like Joe Kennedy. Sorry, too many Kennedys. Yeah. Um, but like, like what what would we expect in those situations? And maybe mm. leveraging that, are there sort of other clever discontinuities we might think about in terms of like close elections where you could have gotten an old person, but you got the young person? Or do you have anything, in but maybe you want to keep that to yourself? No, we're really, no, this is, these are all really relevant questions. One, the state and local level uh, where money does travel for, that's like one of the ironies of the, you know, a lot of the rest of my research is local candidates really, and state legislative candidates really say, unlike those distant fat cats in DC, you know, I'm sort of, you know, among you, the people close to the ground, but ironically, like voters know a lot less about state and local candidates, have a harder time without interest group help. Uh, deciding between candidates and then money travels a lot further. So on the one hand, it pushes back state and local government is younger um, and that pushes back because if money in politics is more important, it should be older in fact. But I would say it's like a particular interact, like sort of functionally you do start in state or local office and the exceptions are like AOC going straight to federal level and things like that. Um, so I think that's important. And then like the close election RDs in these representational things. So we did that in the race and money and politics stuff, myself and Alexander Son, when a uh, you know female candidate barely wins a primary against a male candidate, then the donors become more female in the general. Same thing with race, when an Asian candidate beats a non-Asian candidate, more Asian donors. Um, that is true. I would say, you know, in gender, we kind of have enough sample to do close election. But I would say now, increasingly, if you've seen the close elections to see the extremism penalty, sort of the Andy Hall work, I would say uh, because there's so few close elections, it becomes a highly strange sample that you have to pool across many years. And politics has changed since like 1978. I don't think it's uh, the extremism penalty, first measuring extremism in 1978 when the music was incredible versus today is very different. It's not the same dimension. Um, secondly, like these are weird 
election. So I do think the more within district type of diff and diff setups and ones that get a larger sample of these elections are showing sort of different estimates there. So I wouldn't, like, I don't think we are going to pursue a close election RD, but that's a great uh, design in these representational studies often. Thanks. Great. So thank you so much. Let's give a hand. Thank you, guys. This was really fun. Great group.